Welcome to Applying Effective Learning Design, a presentation by Tess Taylor. Please take a moment to limit all distractions for the duration of the training. According to Statista, total expenditure on workplace training in the United States was estimated at 83 billion US dollars in 2019. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, these figures are sure to increase as more companies have shifted to remote workforces that require online training solutions. Instructional designers in the corporate training markets are challenged with creating current job-related courseware around sound instructional design principles. The way that courses are presented is just as important as the content itself. In developing training, organizations engage in instructional design, a process guided by systemic design models and principles focusing on establishing and maintaining efficient and effective human performance. This is critical in the business world because studies of industries in the United States and in other countries have shown that investment in training is linked to increased employee productivity and to organizational profitability. Performance outcomes are dictated by how well the learning and design team has created the learning experience and how closely it's aligned to corporate analysis and objectives. The first step in creating the best learning design is to conduct a learner analysis to dig deeper into their needs. For the purposes of this presentation, imagine you are an HR manager tasked with developing professional training for your management team around the topic of diversity and inclusion. Your demographic for this training is your adult workforce who are either existing managers or entering into management as a career path. You will want to inventory the knowledge your demographic has by issuing a questionnaire in advance. Consider their cognitive abilities too, such as their math reading comprehension levels. You will also want to measure their physiological needs to address any disabilities or additional accommodation needed. Lastly, find out what the learning style is that each person prefers. For example, self-selection of learning materials, team learning, classroom instruction, and if you have data on their personality type, this can help sort that out. With this data in hand, it's time to determine the specific instructional needs of your learners. You will conduct a training needs analysis to determine what the training should focus on to produce the most favorable results. In this case, better performance and awareness of the concepts of diversity and inclusion. You will establish a concrete corporate objective that addresses this. According to Kim Morrison, the Content and Marketing Coordinator for Administrate and a regular contributor to the e-learning industry, training needs analysis is a process that a business goes through in order to determine all the training that needs to be completed in a certain period to allow the team to complete their job as effectively as possible, as well as progress and grow. The best design training takes into consideration the organizational objectives, what current training exists, if there have been any policy or procedural updates, what training resources are available to support the effort, such as subject matter experts, and identifying who specifically needs this training as it applies to their role in the organization. For the purposes of the course on diversity inclusion, the organizational objective is to educate and create awareness about diversity and inclusion as a corporate value. There is no current training, but recent policy changes in the industry are putting pressure on companies to have this type of training included as part of all management professional development. Internal resources include the current director of organizational development, who has a history of promoting diversity, and the company has decided all managers should get this training. One of the unique aspects of training adult learners is that they approach learning with predetermined attitudes, ideas, and knowledge from past experiences. 
However, every learner comes with varying levels of prior knowledge. In an article in Learning Solutions Magazine, Dr. Patty Shank, an internationally known workplace learning expert, instructional designer, researcher, and author, explains how to harness this knowledge. She says, prior knowledge means what we know as stored in memory. When people have inadequate or incorrect prior knowledge, it is difficult to learn, understand, or make decisions. So previous knowledge is beneficial for all, and so she recommends the use of different learning strategies to meet learners where they are. It's obvious that we need to provide foundational knowledge for those with less knowledge, and this is a refresher for those who have more knowledge. Multimedia in learning design provides a means to engage with learners on many levels. From audio and visual to interactive technology, there are limitless ways to promote learning when it is used appropriately. In an article published in the Kappa Delta Pi record at the University of Rhode Island, a small team of researchers shared their insight concerning the use of multimedia in learning design. They said, Universal design for learning does not necessarily require the purchase of the latest technology and equipment. However, resourceful teachers enlist a variety of materials and learning experiences that involve all learners in meaningful ways. The core principles of UDL are multiple means of representation, multiple means for engagement, and multiple means for action and expression. Therefore, when using multimedia elements in learning, it's important to address these three areas so that all learners, regardless of ability, experience, or learning preference, can benefit the most. This, is, this often means using adaptive technology that is friendly to all learners, such as web-based training modules delivered with language and closed captioning, as one example. In order to determine what multimedia needs to be included in a corporate training endeavor, let's look at some of the factors. First, is the media relevant to the learning subject, and is it the best way to deliver learning content? Can learners connect the experience of the media with real-world applications of the material? What level of interactivity produces the best results? Is it better to work in teams and collaborate on a learning exercise or work independently? What will motivate the learners the most? You don't want your learners just going through the motions and therefore make sure there is a meaningful incentive. Lastly, how well you connect with the learners can determine how well they stay engaged in the learning itself. Multimedia can facilitate all of these things depending on each learner's preferences. But don't go overboard with it. Keep the learning content first and center and media secondary for the best results. A major component of a well-designed workforce learning effort is the ability to measure the results. Assessments should be directly tied to corporate objectives and these objectives need to be job skill specific. From research, we know that any assessment should happen while learning is happening and at the very end. The assessment is for the organization's benefit to use this data for making improvements in the course content and delivery. A combination of formative and summative assessments provide rich information about how each learner experienced the learning and its impact on their future performance. As part of my studies as a student at the American College of Education, I had the opportunity to participate in a PowerPoint skills inventory found at Think Outside the Slide. A link to this inventory is found at the end of this presentation in the resources section. My personal results and challenge area are displayed here. It appears that my skills for focusing an audience needed the most work. I'm tasked with learning how to add callouts and visuals, making slides less distracting, using hidden slides and transitioning from slides to hidden elements, and presenting these ideas in a workbook format using the hidden slides. 
Fortunately, there are many free tutorials available where I may develop these skills. To apply these new PowerPoint design skills, I plan on creating at least one hidden slide in a future set of lessons, animating it so that it is revealed by a slide transition, and printing out the hidden slide in an instructor's guide. I also can use some practice in other areas of slide animations, so we'll likely practice these design elements too. This concludes the presentation. I hope you found some helpful information here. If you want to learn more, here's a list of all references and tools mentioned.